Thank you very much, Nami. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I had a more hectic than usual morning and uh, for various reasons. So it took me a while to kind of get in the right frame of mind that I should have been in from the beginning. But anyway, there now. So, um, you think about it, our brains are pretty amazing because uh, they virtually record everything, virtually everything that happens to us, um, but not much of it is important, right? So, <clears throat> um, some people can re remember the most arcane and useless information, but they can't remember to take the rubbish out the same day every week. And I won't, I'm not referring to any particular member of my family when I say that. <laughs> um, but there are things that we should definitely not forget, right? People's names, especially people we've met multiple times. Uh, we should remember them. Anniversaries. Those stupid passwords to get into whatever it is we're trying to get into. And they say not to use the same one, but I have to. I can't have 30 different ones. I'm not going to remember all those things. So there's much to remember, but we can't remember it all. But today's passage that we're going to read is going to remind us what it is that we should make it a point to remember. But before we do that, let's pray together. Please bow your heads with me. Father, well, thank you for gathering us together. And we're going to see that that's something that took place in the passage we're going to read today. And you gathered us together this morning to teach us. And so, Father, uh, may we be good students, have open hearts and open minds. And whatever we think uh, of you, let, us, let it be open, Father, to something new that you want to show us, that uh, we are good clay, molded and shaped by you. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read in Mark. Um, our passage this morning is Mark 8, 1 through 21. It's a, a little long, and it's actually three separate stories, but they are connected. <coughs> and we're going to see that they make a larger point when put together. So let's read that. Mark 8, starting at verse 1. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way, because some of them have come a long distance. And his disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. So he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. And when he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmathuna, whatever that is. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got into the boat, back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And they discussed this with one another and said, It's because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? And they answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? This is the word of the Lord. 
So there's three things we're going to see from this passage that we should remember. And the first is this, that God provides for us. So above all else, all there is to think about, God cares about people. They are his priority. People are. And these people that he's dealing with are hungry. So what does he do? Now, he could send them away, right? He has no obligation to feed these people. They came to hear him. And there, he's sending them away. He's done. He's done teaching. He say, it's not my problem. See ya. Have a good time. But he doesn't do that. What does he do? He feeds them. Now, what is his motive? Why does Jesus do that? And his motive is clearly to meet their need. Now, how do we know that? Because Jesus doesn't draw any attention to himself. He doesn't say, hey, everybody, wait. I know you're hungry, and I know you, you uh, really want to eat something. Well, I'm going to provide it. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do this miracle. Watch. Watch me do this. He doesn't say anything like that. Right? They probably don't even know where this food came from. He does it very quietly because he's not drawing attention to himself. He wants to feed the people. That's his objective. And the truth is that God feeds all people every single day. Right? Now that's easy to overlook, I think, for us because there was a time when most people had to grow their own food. They were the ones that had to produce their own food. Right? And so the fickleness of weather and disease and things they couldn't control, I think, made them far more conscious of their dependence on God for their food. But we live in a different culture. We live in a culture where the food is grown for us. Now, some of us may grow our own food, but most of us don't. Somebody else is doing We don't know who it is. We don't know where it comes from. And it's easy to get. There's so many places we could go to get food. It's not hard to get. It's easy to get. The problem we've got to figure out is where to get it, right? Who's got the best deal? Who's got the best thing? We have so many options, so many choices. And so it's so easy, in fact, that it's easy to forget that God provides for us. Now, pets know who feed them, don't they? Do you have a pet? Your pet knows that you're it. Right? I, I have a cat. Cats are fickle. I like cats better than dogs. I like dogs. Dogs are just too demanding. I'm sorry. I don't have time to, to provide the love a dog wants. Uh, but a cat doesn't need much. I can provide that. But nevertheless, when I feed our cat, you know what he's doing? He's smelling me. That's how he identifies me. I'm the one that feeds him. Pets know who feed them. But do people know that? Do people know that they are fed by God? How many people thank God for their food? And do we? Do we do that? I mean, as a matter of habit, as an acknowledgement, hey, this came from God. Now, twice in this passage, it says that Jesus gave thanks for the food. Twice, Jesus did it. And he assured us in another passage that he said, look, God feeds the birds. The birds are not starving. He's feeding them. And you and I are worth many birds, right? If God takes the time and effort to feed the birds, we're worth many birds. He will feed us. Now, some people may say, well, what about starving people? There's famine in the world. What about that? How's God providing for them? And I think we see an answer in, in uh, if you remember in the Old Testament, the story of Joseph in Egypt. So the, the leader of Egypt, Pharaoh, had a dream. Joseph interpreted it. There was... And it basically came out to there's going to be seven years of plenty, lots of food. Seven years of lots of food, followed by seven years of famine, right? So, so God provided enough. There was going to be a famine, but God provided enough. God also provided the plan so that nobody had to starve. And the fact of the matter is God provides all the food every person on earth needs. And the world has gotten much better. Starvation and hunger throughout the world has been reduced tremendously because God makes enough food. The problem is we don't distribute it properly. So it's not a lack of God's provision. He's always provided enough. Now, it's not just having food either. So it's, it's the variety of food available to us. So the other night I was having dinner with my wife and we were having leftovers. So the night before I, I had uh, men's meeting, so I wasn't for dinner there for dinner, but a couple of the kids came over, she made dinner for them, and we had leftovers, there was leftovers, so we had that for dinner. And I, you may not be familiar with all this food, but so we had leftover egg drop soup, she made it, and um, she makes this hamburger, she mixes miso with it, you know what miso is, so mix it with hamburger, then you eat it on raw cucumber, 
And so we're eating that, and then at the end we had this, um, it was a tangerine I got from Whole Foods, like this special kind, super expensive, so we bought just one. Right, you're not gonna buy a bunch, but we bought one. And as we're eating it, it's so good, and I'm thinking, this food, I mean, th these flavors did not exist before. God made them up. He made them up. Why did he do that? For our pleasure, so we could enjoy it. Right, food is fuel, but it's not just something we shove in our mouth and we don't just, it's like a gas tank, right? We don't just stick it in and fill up the tank. We get to enjoy it. Food is a pleasure. God did that and he did it for us. And are we grateful that he did? So it's important that we remember that God is our provider and he'll meet all of our needs, not just our hunger needs, amen? The second thing we need to remember is that God gives us purpose. So if I'm in the education field and I know there's other teachers here and as teachers, sometimes we see, we know that the homework we're getting back from our students was done by the parent. <laughs> very clear it's obvious why well the kid can't do it in class but his homework comes back perfect his handwriting is sloppy in class it's written perfectly when it comes home the parent did the homework why would they do that well maybe it makes them to feel good to know hey man this fourth grade math is easy I can do it I don't know I don't know why they do it maybe they think it's gonna help their child's grade it's not it doesn't count. It's not helping your child at all for you to do their homework. And yet people do it. Now Jesus wanted to feed these people. And he had a lot of options on how to do it. If he really wanted to, he could have said, the, put the food right in their stomach. Right? If he could turn a stone into bread, if he can make something out of nothing, he could say, I know you guys are hungry, you're in a hurry. Fine, I'm just going to, you're full, right? You're full. I put the food in your stomach. See you later. You're on your way. He could have done that if he wanted to, but he didn't. What did he do? He was a good teacher. They were right to call him teacher. Jesus was a good teacher. He was the best teacher. And so he involved his students in what he was going to do. He taught them a lesson. What's the first thing he did? He said, look, Look at the situation. What is the situation? And look at it from a people perspective. Are the people's needs being met? No, they're tired and they're hungry. Their needs are not met. Then the second thing is this. Okay, we identified the problem. We have hungry people. What do you have? What do you have that can solve the problem? We got seven loaves. Seven loaves of bread. Okay, that's what you got. Whatever you got, that's what you got. That, what do you have? That's enough. And the third is this. You got to work with God. Get God involved. Now, helping people is God's idea. We don't have to bribe God. We don't have to convince God. It, God wants to do it. God is anxious to help people. He wants to do it. Now, there are some people in the world, they say they can't believe in God because of all the suffering in the world. How can there be a good God? with all this suffering. But the truth is, nobody cares more about suffering than God. Nobody. And I, they say, well, why doesn't he do something about it? But he did. He did. In fact, he solved the problem of suffering. He did it. And he did it at great cost to himself. It was, it was he who suffered more than anybody else to solve this problem. Well, why don't we see the solution yet? Well. God will do it in his time. It is solved and it is coming. There's a time coming when there will be no suffering. But there's still some suffering uh, that has to be. Now, God redeems that. It has a purpose. But God's work is to serve people. That's God's work, is to serve people. That's the work that he does. And it's meaningful work. It is uh, important work. It's holy work and it's good. And it is eternal the work that God does is eternal. And he invites you and I to participate in that. He gives us purpose, right? We're not doing useless stuff. We say, I'm going to give you eternal stuff to do, stuff that will last forever because it's righteous. Someday we're all going to stand before God. He's going to take all the things we've done and he's going to test them. He's going to test them by fire. And the useless things we did, the things we did just to satisfy ourselves, they're going to be burned up. He says, we will suffer loss. It's over, it's done. It has no eternal value. But the things that we did for him, said they will survive the fire. There'll be an eternal reward. They will last forever because of the things we've done for him. 
It's one short life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Here's a measure of our spiritual maturity. And we're all at a different place in our spiritual maturity. Are we participating in God's work of serving people? And I want to give you a chance to do that today. I'm going to give you an opportunity. And there's plenty of opportunities. No lack of opportunities. But one is uh, we could help our sound man break down the sound. Where is he at? He's out there. He's, he's drinking coffee, not listening to the message. Which he, he, he really needs to hear this message desperately. Um, also, in the calf. There's a curriculum fair, a Kai school curriculum fair, and they're taking it down. Now, what if we, who can, and you know, some of us could and some of us couldn't for various reasons. What if we just, those who could, went for 15 minutes, dedicated 15 minutes, I'll give you 15 minutes. Couldn't we accomplish a lot? I think we could. And we could show the school, show the principal, hey, Matt, we're not just a, a group that meets here on Sunday. We live what we say. We want to show you God is good. Shouldn't people who are provided by God, be givers, right? If God is giving to us, shouldn't we be givers even more so? Amen? All right, the third thing is this. The third thing we need to remember is that God protects us. Now, in this story, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, come to Jesus, and they want a sign, but they don't really want a sign. Jesus has done plenty of them. There's no lack of signs. He just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. There's plenty of signs. They don't really want one. What they want, their problem is they want a particular kind of sign. In other words, they have an idea of what the Savior is going to be, and Jesus doesn't fit their vision. Jesus is the Savior, but they think he should be like this, and they want Jesus to conform to their idea, and he doesn't. And so Jesus warns his disciples he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, the disciples need this teaching. They obviously do not get it, because what's their conversation? They're talking to each other and said, Jesus is mad. We didn't bring any bread. Yeah, why didn't you bring bread? No, you, you banana, you were supposed to bring the bread. <laughs> and Jesus hears it and said, you dummies, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about bread. Don't you get it? You saw me feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. You saw me do that, remember that? And then you saw me feed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread, right? Do you remember seeing that? The last thing you need to worry about is bread. Is feed, you got one loaf, that's enough. If we run out, I'll make more. I'm God, I'm proving this to you. Why are you worried about that? They didn't get the first thing. They didn't remember the very first thing. God provides for us, so they're stuck on that. How can God show them bigger, more important things if they're stuck on, well, we don't have enough bread. We're worried about bread. God doesn't want us to worry about those things. Now, parents, there are some parents that want to wrap their children in bubble wrap, right? They just want to protect them from any possible harm that would come their way. If they're, again, I'm in education, so sometimes, I mean, sometimes every kid is going to go off track to some way and some degree. And sometimes a teacher may have to talk to you about that. And there's some parents are just defensive. They don't want to hear any criticism of their child. Well, every child goes off track. It's not a big deal, right? But some, they just, they can't allow it. And so they don't want their child to experience any pain, any sorrow, any criticism. That doesn't, that's not good for them. And God does not do that. I just want to tell you, he does not do that to his children. And Jesus is trying to protect his children now. He's trying to do it by preparing them. So in other words, he doesn't say, look, I'm going to protect you. You're never going to encounter an evil or a difficult person. I won't allow it. You'll never have to encounter such a person. He doesn't say that. He says, look, you are going to encounter evil, difficult people, and they're going to challenge you, and I want to prepare you. You need to be ready to deal with that. Just like our kids, they're going to, we can't be with them every moment of every day. We've got to teach them how to deal with difficult people. They're going to run into evil. It's going to tempt them. Well, we're not going to be there to protect them. We have to teach them how to deal with it. That's what God is doing. And the real danger is to encounter those who oppose Christ, Jesus Christ. They preach another gospel. They preach a gospel that's only for a few people. It's only for the good who've earned it. Right? Not everybody gets in. Just the good. Us. We get in. Not the other people. 
But that's not the gospel Jesus preached. Everybody gets in. Anybody can come, right? The beautiful and the ugly, the athletic and the clumsy, the rich and the destitute. Everybody gets in. You could be a genius. You could be mentally limited. It doesn't matter. Everybody gets in. But the, the, the good people don't want that. They want a gospel that's just for them. Now, little leaven can have a big impact. One wrong idea can corrupt our thinking. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, the source, ultimately, of all this is the devil. His goal is to spread lies, right? He wants anybody that doesn't believe Jesus is is Christ, the origin of that is the devil. He doesn't want people to know. That's the fact. That's the truth. But people don't believe that. And I, I realize that there's... A, a lot of reasons for that. It's sophisticated. It's, he's, a, he's a good liar. He's the best liar. He makes a lie sound like the truth. He makes a bad thing seem good. He's excellent at it. But he's a lion trying to devour who he can, to eat who he can. And that, see, Jesus had a bunch of uh, Drax the Destroyers, right? You know Drax the Destroyers? Well, you should. You should. <laughs> So there's a, the movie Guardians of the Galaxy and one of the characters named Drax the Destroyer and he takes everything literally, right? So when they, they're telling him, hey, don't let, you know, somebody's explaining oh, this race of people, they're very literal. Metaphors go over their head and he hears that and says, hey, nothing goes over my head. I'll catch it. It won't go over my head. So Jesus' disciples are taking everything he says literally, right? They, they, they're not understanding what he's saying But the devil is a lion who goes around devouring who he can, right? Not literally, but he wants to take advantage of who he can. He wants to pick off the weak ones of Jesus' followers. So they stop following him. We have to beware of his leaven. We have to beware of the wrong ideas. They're going to mess with our head. They're going to get us off track. The example we saw last week is that the Pharisees said, hey, look, God looks at the external more than the internal Are we doing outwardly the things that make us look good? Well, God doesn't care about that. He wants us to be good. He wants to get to the inside. And to do that, we need to know the truth. And are we dedicated to that? Do we know the truth? And Paul said this. What did Paul say? The sum of my preaching is this. I preach Christ and Him crucified. Right? Why? Because that's the fundamental truth. We all need to know. All of God's truth is built on that idea. That's the foundation of our faith. Nothing else matters as long as we have that. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for uh, your goodness and your truth trying to protect us. We're going to be out in a world filled with bad people. They're they're out there and bad ideas, and they want to get us off track. They want to corrupt our thinking So we don't believe you are good. We don't believe that you'll provide for all our needs. We don't believe that you are the Savior who will ultimately take us from this world and bring us to paradise. Well, Father, may may our thinking and our, our belief be pure, Father. Help us all to believe the truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.